Good morning, everyone. Uh, today's presentation is on change in respiratory system with exercises. So uh, the exercise physiology is basically during strenuous exercises, there is an increased oxygen consumption with increased carbon dioxide production. So we have divided uh, it into short-term effects and long-term effects. The short-term effects mainly causes some physiological changes, while long-term effects creates more of anatomical changes. So short-term uh, effects are divided into increase, uh, are the increase in respiratory rate, increase in tidal volume, increase in ventilation with increased oxygen uptake. While the long-term effects are there is increase in lung ventilation, increase in the strength of intercostal muscles, increased oxygen diffusion rate, increased minute ventilation, increased number of capillaries and alveoli. And lastly, there is an increased lactate threshold. So let's go into the details of short-term effects. So there is an increase in respiratory rate. At rest, normally, we have a respiratory rate of 12 to 15 breaths per minute. While during exercises, it can increase to about 40 to 45 breaths per minute. With the exercise, the carbon dioxide level in the blood increases, which in turn triggers the respiratory centers to increase. So I have represented in a flow chart where energy demand increases, requiring more oxygen intake, thus increasing breathing. There is also an increased tidal volume. Normally, the tidal volume is 500 ml. During exercises, it goes up to 1000 ml and in athletes, it is noted to, have to be around 2000 ml. The tidal volume can increase only up to vital capacity, but not more than that. The tidal volume and the respiratory rate combined contributes to the minute ventilation, which eventually increases. So here we have a, a graph showing between the minute volume of ventilation with the minutes from uh, the start of exercise. So it's divided into phase one, two, three. So in phase one, we can see a sudden rise. Phase two, there's a curving, while then later it plateaus to phase three. So, uh, increase in minute ventilation in phase one, there's a sudden uh, increase in ventilation, which is explained by anticipation. So, there's an anticipatory rise, which is explained by a purely feed forward input to medullary respiratory control and neurons from the supramedullary regions of the motor cortex and hypothalamus and operates along the synaptic pathways in parallel with the motor control of locomotor muscles. Next, in phase two, we have mostly is the proprioceptive impulses. So the efferents from the locomotor muscle projects via the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and then via the nucleus of solitary tract to the medullary cardiorespiratory controller neurons, which results in pro proportionate increase in minute ventilation. Here we have to, here there is no involvement of the arterial chemoreceptors in immediate ventilatory response to exercise. So here we have a spirometry pattern of a normal uh, of uh, of at rest, followed by there is uh, during light exercises the tidal volume uh, remains to be the same. Uh, in moderate exercise, we notice that with uh, the increase in exercise, there is an increasing uh, respiratory frequency. Later, uh, what's the difference between an untrained and a trained? Uh, uh, person, the, what's the difference in spirometry? So, while in, during maximum ex exercises, an untrained person will re require more expiratory reserve volume with increased breathing frequencies, while a trained athlete will conserve the expiratory reserve vo volume with increase in respiratory rate. So, the uh, next point is increase in oxygen uptake, which is explained by increased perfusion of, of the lung, increased diffusion of oxygen across the respiratory membrane, increased alveolar artery gradient of PO2. So, increased perfusion of lung, basically we have three zones. The first zone is no flow where the alveolar air pressure is greater than arterial pressure which is not found in normal lungs. Zone two is intermittent flow uh, where the systolic arterial pressure rises higher than the alveolar pressure but the diastolic arterial pressure falls below the alveolar air pressure which is mostly found in the apical regions of the lungs. Zone 3 is where you have a continuous flow where the arterial pressure and the pulmonary capillary pressure remain greater than alveolar air pressure at all times. So what happens during exercises? So a major reason for the increased blood flow is that the pulmonary vascular pressure rises enough during exercise to convert the lung apices from a zone 2 pattern into a zone 3 pattern of flow. So what happens during heavy exercises? The extra flow, uh, what happens during heavy exercise to the extra flow, which is where does it, where is it accommodated in the lung? So there are three ways. 
Uh, one is by increasing the number of open capillaries, sometimes as much as threefold. Secondly, it's by distending all the capillaries and increasing the rate of flow through each capillary more than twofold. Uh, thirdly, it is by increasing the pulmonary arterial pressure. Next point is increased diffusion of oxygen across the respiratory membrane. So during the strainous exercises, there is an increase in pulmonary blood flow and alveolar ventilation. So the diffusion capacity for oxygen increases in young men to a maximum of about 65 ml per minute per mmHg, which is three times the diffusion capacity under resting condition. This happens due to opening up of many dormant pulmonary capillaries or extra dilatation of already open capillaries, which leads to increasing the surface area of the blood into which the oxygen can diffuse. So here uh, next is the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve in, during exercises. So during exercises, there is a decrease in pH, uh, which is caused by uh, there's lactic acid being secreted from the muscle cells, which makes, uh, which decreases the pH. Next point is there's an increase in muscle temperature uh, during uh, muscle contraction. Next, uh, thirdly, there is an increase in partial pressure of carbon dioxide due to, uh, really, uh, due to the, uh, from the working muscles. Fourthly, there's an increase in byproduct molecule from glycolysis known as 2,3-BPT, which all results in shift, rightward shift of the oxygen dissociation curve, uh, which is why we have increased oxygen supply to the uh, muscles during exercises. Next, we have increased alveolar arterial gradient of PO2. Here, the efficiency of gas exchange for oxygen within the lung is defined and quantified as the difference PO2 of PO2 between the alveolar gas and the arterial blood, mm. which is known as alveolar to arterial PO2 diffuse. In a healthy individual, the uh, normal alveolar arterial gradient of PO2 is 5 to 10 mmHg, while during exercises, it goes up to 15 to 25. So here we have a graph again, um, uh, where there is maximum oxygen uptake versus time. So here the, we have two components that uh, will be explained. Uh, one is oxygen deficit and one is oxygen depth. What is oxygen deficit? So in the beginning of the uh, exercise, there will be uh, an increase of uh, oxygen demand, uh, more than oxygen consumption, which is normally met by uh, depleting the stored reserves. Then later when the demand increases, it is met by the anaerobic pathway. So this is oxygen deficit. So there's an oxygen deficit created there. So what is oxygen depth? Oxygen depth is after the period of strenuous exercises, there's an excess oxygen consumed during the recovery phase. So this excess oxygen is used to convert the reaccumulated lactic acid into glucose via Cori cycle. And uh, the next is to convert AMP and ADP to ATP and to re-establish normal concentration of oxygen bound with hemoglobin and myoglobin. And uh, lastly, to raise the concentration of oxygen in the lungs. So now we come to the long-term effects, which causes mostly the anatomical changes. Here, there is an uh, there is an increased strength of the respiratory muscles, where you can see the diaphragm and the intercostal muscle increases in strength, which results in an improved ability to breathe in more air for longer with less fatigue. So the aerobic training tends to improve. Uh, the endurance of the respiratory muscles, while the anaerobic training tends to increase the size and the strength of the respiratory muscles. The next is it also increases the oxygen diffusion rate by increasing the number and the size of the capillaries, which leads to more efficient diffusion. Lastly, uh, there's an increase in anaerobic or lactate threshold. So here, in, during physical training, there's an increase in the oxidative capacity of the skeletal muscle by inducing mitochondrial pro proliferation and increasing the concentration of oxidative enzymes and the synthesis of glycogen and triglycerides. These alterations uh, results in the lowering of the concentration of blood, blood lactates in trained subjects than those found in the untrained people, reflecting increased aerobic energy production. So here is a summarized uh, flowchart of what I have been, I've been uh, explaining all this while. So there will be an anticipatory rise, rise from the locomotor muscles, uh, which triggers which triggers uh, the uh, medullary neurons, uh, following which collaterals are given to the uh, intercostal muscles and the diaphragm muscles, which uh, helps in uh, the control, uh, control of ventilation. There is very less um, uh, response from the uh, central and the peripheral central, uh, chemoreceptors uh, during uh, strenuous exercises. So that's how, that is what is being explained in this flowchart. Uh, thank you. Thank you.